Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the ACOM Shoulder Disorders Evidence-Based Treatment Webinar. This webinar focuses on common shoulder disorders treatments as well as delayed recovery. Today's program is being recorded. There is one hour of CME and MOC credit for this program. You received a verification form with today's instructions, or you can follow the link that was in the instructions for the form. No certificates will be sent to you, but your transcript of this and other ACOM educational programs can be viewed and printed from the ACOM website. Members and non-members can both view their transcripts directly from the website. Today's program consists of approximately 50 minutes of lecture with questions at the end. We will address questions as time permits and suggest you submit your questions early for consideration. We are only accepting questions electronically. On the screen, you can see how to open the question box in order to submit your questions. This was also in the PDF file of your handouts you received with the instructions. This educational activities presenters and planners have indicated they have no disclosures to be made. It is my pleasure to introduce our presenter for today, Dr. Jeffrey Harris. Dr. Harris, you may begin. Thank you, Sandy. So today we're going to talk about the shoulder guideline. Uh, when we put this together, it was the revised second edition. I believe the electronic third edition is now out, basically the same information. And as we've been doing, we'll look at the mechanism of injury or illness uh, before we proceed to diagnosis and treatment so that you are able to make good judgments about whether something is work-related and what's causing it. There are a, a whole variety of different uh, problems here. We'll start with injuries. The mechanism of falling on the top of the shoulder generally results in something on the spectrum of acromioclavicular strain to separation. They're all in the same code series, but and they're, the orthopedists call these grades one through three strains. Um, I believe a grade three is a complete tear. Um, the fall on the outstretched arm can result in several different things, rotator cuff strain uh, progressing to a tear. Again, this is a spectrum or a tear of the labrum, which of course is not part of the rotator cuff. Heavy lifting is believed to cause rotator cuff tears acutely. Direct lateral trauma can result in a labral tear. A sudden pull is another mechanism for rotator cuff tears. Repeated overhead work is believed to cause impingement syndrome and bursitis, uh, those two are not necessarily distinguishable because part of the definition of impingement syndrome includes subacromial bursitis. So there's some fuzziness about the actual diagnostic terminology. If there's prior dislocation uh, or prior trauma resulting in dislocation, then you can have a recurrent dislocation or shoulder instability. Then there's a question of overuse versus conditioning. In other words, is the, are the person and the job compatible? Uh, that's an ongoing debate, but something re can result in nonspecific pain. Uh, this would be a, a mechanical cause for it. On the other hand, there are a series of things we're calling illnesses because there's no specific traumatic event. And that can include degenerative changes as each of us gets older. Um, the, if you look at the underside of the rotator cuff with an arthroscope or a high resolution MRI, you can see fraying because the blood supply is not particularly great, similar to what you see in the meniscus and the knee. And every so often the white cells don't des decide they don't like that and send, um, send uh, enzymes out try to clean up the mess, and that results in inflammatory changes, which are perceived as impingement syndrome. You'll notice that there's no really good way to distinguish between uh, random degenerative episodes 
particularly in older workers. This is not seen in younger folks. And some trauma. So I'd be careful about how you attribute this. There are a series of other problems that we really don't know what causes them. Adhesive capsulitis and calcific bursitis um, appear to happen primarily in older women for reasons that aren't clear. I think there's a statistical association with diabetes, but the mechanism's not clear. Rotator cuffs will occasionally tear for no obvious reason, and impingement can occur for what appears to be no obvious reason, primarily in younger folks. So you can see that some of this is a matter of judgment and speculation when attributing things. Um, one study showed that there's a, an association between adhesive capsulitis and lack of activity. And that's particularly true, at least in terms of <clears throat> progressive inability to move the shoulder post-traumatically um, if people don't do range of motion exercises. Shoulder instability in many cases is actually congenital as opposed to post-traumatic. <clears throat> if somebody is subject to barrow trauma, for example, caisson workers or um, divers, uh, that can result in osteonecrosis of the shoulder uh, as a result of uh, either nitrogen bubbles in the circulation or lack of oxygen. Diabetes is associated with osteonecrosis. Um, precise mechanism not clear. And as I said, with adhesive capsulitis, and then there are statistical associations between smoking and osteonecrosis, alcohol use and osteonecrosis, and as in the hip, uh, steroid use and osteonecrosis. Are there any questions about mechanisms? Apparently not. So how do we diagnose shoulder disorders? And this is, this is hard because a number of these things don't have very specific diagnostic criteria. So impingement <clears throat> is somewhat of a, uh, I won't say garbage can diagnosis, but it was created back in the 80s or 90s by the orthopedists <clears throat> to try and create a larger category than trying to be very specific about whether there was adhesive capsulitis or tendinopathy or bursitis or whatever. Um, so that's why it's listed as a, a bunch of things lumped together. The symptomatic characteristics <clears throat> excuse me, are pain in the shoulder at night and sometimes non-radiating pain in the deltoid area. Um, this is also uh, what's not listed here is that if you sleep on that side, it tends to be considerably worse. The theory is that the circulation is compromised as you fold your shoulder over. And it tends to be worse if people slump forward at work for the same reason. Um, the signs that you see <clears throat> are, uh, well, if you have a negative near or Hawkins sign, which are both impingement signs, that is used to rule it out as opposed to rule it in. Uh, you generally see several of these tests being positive. Uh, there will often but not always be tenderness over the subacromial bursa, and often but not always tenderness over the deltoid, or sorry, the biceps groove. Um, if there's tenderness over the subacromial bursa, you could tag it as bursitis. In a rotator cuff tear, uh, then these range from micro tears to full thickness tears. Um, <clears throat> there's pain over the deltoid area with overhead work, and this would be more small tears because with full tears you can't lift your arm over your shoulder. Um, there's weakness on elevation and external rotation. If you're testing somebody with physical maneuvers, thumbs down abduction will be weak. So this is where you have them put their arms out at 90 degrees, thumbs down, and press up against your hands. And you have to be careful that this is involuntary rather than voluntary, and that it's not just due to the fact that you're in the painful arc, which is between about 80 degrees and 110 degrees of motion. <clears throat> um, there's also weak external rotation, particularly with elevation. Now, if you have a labral tear, there will be pain with motion, but also catching. So um, 
what you see on examination is apparent shoulder instability. It may not be gross shoulder instability with uh, an anterior slide test that's positive. So you try to slide the shoulder forward and it moves out of where it's supposed to be. With recurrent dislocation, the patient will often report a feeling that their shoulder dislocated, although it doesn't appear to be dislocated when you see them. And it will abduct in external rotation. <clears throat> That's fairly complex. But um, what you'll see on exam is a positive apprehension sign. So this is similar to other parts of the body where you uh, start to press on the shoulder in the direction of the dislocation, the patient gets very worried you're going to pop it out again. This is generally not conscious. In the case of AC strains, there will be pain over the AC joint. You have to, and tenderness as well, distinguish this from AC arthritis, which is reasonably common in older workers and has the same symptoms and signs. Um, in the case of AC separation, <clears throat> there tends to be severe pain over the acromioclavicular joint, and you can see a distal, uh, high riding distal clavicle on occasion. Sorry, I'm just going to go back and make sure I didn't hit this twice, which I did. In shoulder instability, <clears throat> there's a feeling of slipping or popping and a feeling of instability. Dead arm syndrome is uh, somewhat contradictorily described. The idea is they can't, they don't think they can move their arm, but they in fact can. Um, in shoulder instability, then, if you examine the patient, you al also get an apprehension test. And anterior relocation test is that you can uh, relocate it yourself, or they can. The sulcus sign is that you will see a sulcus which normally isn't there near the head of the humerus. In adhesive capsulitis, you will get night pain in the shoulder joint, uh, somewhat similar to impingement, but that tends to be outside of the shoulder joint, and a lack of range of motion. In this case, there's limited range of motion. It's a clinical diagnosis because this isn't adhesive, uh, uh, sorry, um, calcific bursitis, so there's no, not necessarily any x-ray finding. And nonspecific pain, the patient reports pain in the shoulder, but there isn't anything on physical. In osteonecrosis, there will be progressive non-radiating pain at the head of the humerus. It's right where the problem is. There's pain with motion, and particularly if the head of the humerus has collapsed, uh, similar to the way the head of the femur collapses in the hip, you will get pain with motion more frequently. Any questions about signs and symptoms? Just have a quick look here. Nope. If you want to see what some of those signs look like, what I'd recommend is we don't have diagrams in the guidelines yet, but the orthopedist's book, um, which I believe is called just looking for it on my bookshelf here, Essentials of Musculoskeletal Care, which is available from the Academy of Orthopedics. There's a lot of really nice pictures of these various signs and physical maneuvers. So what about diagnostic testing? Well, the question here really is what works and what correlates properly with things. Uh, this tends to look like the hip chapter in which, uh, not, you know, this is sort of the upper extremity version of the hip. Um, there's a lot of recommendations here for imaging, but they, there are caveats. One is that you only want to do imaging if it affects treatment, and particularly that a procedure is contemplated and the patient is interested in the procedure. <clears throat> Otherwise, it's very interesting, but it's not going to affect the course of the case. So with a rotator cuff tear, um, and this is sort of a moving target because MRI resolution is getting better and better. Um, there used to be some argument that you couldn't see some of these things on MRI. I think that's kind of abated, at least with a closed MRI. But that's So that's the first thing that's recommended with or without an arthrogram. And Really, the purpose of the arthrogram is looking for 
tears that are not obvious on a regular MRI. Same thing is true of <clears throat> a labral tear, although in this case, and again, this is parallel to the hip, uh, the MR arthrogram is with gadolinium is sometimes recommended instead of a regular arthrogram. <clears throat> and those two are done in series. In the case of shoulder instability, you can use stress films where you have the person hold weights. Uh, and this is also something that's done with, I'm sorry, with shoulder stress films. Excuse me, I got ahead of myself. Um, this is where you actually try to create uh, the shoulder moving out of the socket. So if somebody gets irradiated trying to do that. Um, an MR arthrogram with manipulation also works. If the shoulder is dislocated when they show up, plain radiographs will show it quite well. Uh, Weight-bearing films, this is where I was going earlier, sorry. Uh, in the case of AC separation, to prove that it's a complete grade three strain, um, the recommendation is to have people hold weights. The patient will not like you at all because when they do this, it hurts like crazy. So that this is something that people tend not to do if they can avoid it. Impingement, uh, the diagnosis is made clinically or by MRI. And generally, the MRI is reserved for cases that aren't resolving so that uh, people know what they're dealing with pre-surgically. Now, when we get into the uh, therapy, there's some debate about surgery for this, but in any event, um, calcific bursitis can be seen on plain films. You can see the calcium deposits. Adhesive capsulitis, um, an MRI is recommended. It's not entirely clear to me what that's all about unless they're looking for scar tissue. And osteonecrosis can generally be seen on plain films, but sometimes you need an MRI to get a really clear picture. <clears throat> now this is somewhat generic. This is turned up in most of the musculoskeletal chapters. If you suspect a, rheumato a rheumatologic disorder, then you look for the appropriate antibodies. For example, uh, rheumatoid factor. There's A-level evidence that this is good as a confirmatory test. The uh, antibody testing as a fishing expedition is a consensus recommendation. Uh, as in other fishing expeditions, you may turn up things you're not looking for. It may be really kind of throwing everything at the wall to see what sticks, which isn't the best diagnostic approach. If you suspect, this is kind of vague here, if you suspect a subacute or chronic mechanical disorder unspecified, presumably if this is there's restricted range of motion or whatever, then um, arthroscopy is recommended to see what's going on under direct visualization. If you suspect inflammation or infection, a SED rate is a good way uh, of screening for things, but not specific. CRP is just a tad more specific, and bone scan would be uh, somewhat of a gold standard here. If the patient has, I'm sorry, that says hip pain, it means it's supposed to be shoulder pain lasting more than several weeks and you can't figure it out, the consensus is to get an x-ray and see if you see something you didn't suspect. Relatively inexpensive, relatively radio insensitive area. Um, this starts to get very vague and so you'd have to be a little bit clearer about what you're looking for. Um, Apparently, this first one, the idea is if you need advanced imaging, a helical CT is better than an old-fashioned CT. If there are contraindications to MRI, such as uh, metal prostheses, pacemaker, and so on, helical CT is the fallback. Um, with subacute or chronic shoulder pain with an unclear source, the orthopedist will do local anesthetic injections to make a diagnosis by having the pain cease when they hit whatever it is they think is the pain generator. Um, I suspect that we're recommending this for people that are pretty good at, hit, at, at doing this and won't be hitting structures they're not supposed to. If you suspect peripheral nerve entrapment, and I'm not clear as to what peripheral nerve this is, this is just quoting from the chapter, presumably we're talking about cutaneous nerves around the shoulder, an EMG is useful. And suspected soft tissue pain, this is getting really vague. 
um, the MRI presumably is being used as some sort of screening test. And again, it's not clear why you should do some of these things unless you have something specific in mind because you can't meet the criteria for uh, intent to treat and consent to treatment. There's a whole bunch of things that are not recommended, and this is the interface between this slide and the last one is a matter of clinical judgment, evidently. Um, antibody panels as a screen because somebody's shoulder hurts, particularly large antibody panels, don't make any sense and were not recommended. Arthroscopy for acute shoulder pain is not recommended. It's not necessary. To treat pain in the absence of a remedial defect, this is similar to knee cleanouts, which don't really work either in the long run. And chondroplasty is not recommended. There's no data to support its effectiveness in shoulder problems. There's a little bit in knee problems and a little bit in hips. Routine or screening bone scans are not recommended. Screening routine or routine CTs or MRIs are not recommended. And there's no evidence that SPECT scans really tell you anything the other scans don't in the shoulder. So that's diagnos diagnosis. How about activity modifications? Well, this gets interesting because um, some level of activity uh, helps prevent weakness in the shoulder, which will atrophy fairly quickly in a manner similar to the, the quadriceps. Um, and adhesive capsulitis is believed to happen when you don't move your shoulders. So these people walking around in slings all the time are just asking for trouble. Um, so range of motion should be really used, uh, active or passive, preferably active. Um, as you can see, their slings are not recommended except for acute, moderate to severe pain <clears throat> for a few days. You really have to talk to the patient about why they need to take the sling off frequently and move their shoulder around. Gentle range of motion exercises, such as the pendulum, uh, in which you're bent forward and, and moving the arm about, is important to keep the shoulder from sticking. That one, of course, does not actually actively involve shoulder muscles, and so it tends to be painless. And then the panel recommended that the patient should maintain maximal levels of act activity within pain and uh, range of motion restriction uh, parameters so that it's in their best interest because uh, th there's a, a contradiction of sorts here. Uh, you'll see shortly that if you manipulate shoulders that are acutely inflamed, sometimes they get worse. So the caveat here is that you want to maintain a reasonable level of activity that keeps the muscles toned, that keeps the shoulder from sticking but that doesn't exacerbate the problem. And it's not necessarily clear that you can write a specific prescription for that. What I tend to do is have a discussion with the patient about what I just said and really encourage them to uh, stay active and maintain motion without pushing things over the edge. So work limitations have to be tailored to the patient's job. You have to find out if the worker has control over job tasks and be more prescriptive if they don't. You have to define, and this is a lot of this is generic, but define basic job requirements, and determine the safety of the tasks, which relates to the diagnosed condition, the patient's age. Uh, unfortunately, muscles do get weaker as you age, which I don't like to admit, but it's true. And uh, biomechanical limitations. If they have restricted range of motion or a re reduced strength, then there are limitations to what they can do. This obviously is related to the severity of the problem, and there are a series of issues which are more generic than just shoulders about uh, organizational issues, such as over working overtime, which tends not to be a good idea with some of these things. Uh, who's got the work allocated, whether they can shift tasks to their coworkers, and whether there are piecework wage incentives, which would get some people to work harder and make themselves worse. Not the most common situation, but it happens. You also need to consider the patient's understanding of his or her condition. 
and you may need to write restrictions or limitations, sorry, uh, write limitations or prescribe activity that are above what the patient feels he or she can do. This is very um, person specific. I mean, there are fear avoidance issues here where patients will be afraid if they do anything, they'll get in trouble. Um, this is very complicated. We'd, I'd, I'd ask you to look. You can't do it yet because it's not out, but shortly the new disability management chapter has a whole bunch of information about trying to figure out motivations and um, limitations and barriers and that sort of thing about why the patient's thinking they can't do something. Um, if they feel like they need to be sedentary, this is probably not a great idea. If you write restrictions that prevent the patient from doing much, um, they're going to get into trouble. And education on your part about the need to remain active is important. So what's interesting about this is that shoulders tend to have increased pain performing almost any function early in rehabilitation, particularly if they haven't moved for quite, you know, days to weeks before they come to see you and you start talking about this. Um, I would listen carefully to increases in symptoms, talk about the factors that are associated with the increases in symptoms, and recalibrate what you're recommending the person do, hopefully as a team with the person. Um, it's important to point out that increases in pain don't necessarily mean cellular damage or structural damage particularly with chronic pain patients who tend to catastrophize, and that's actually fairly well documented, and interpret anything that feels a little odd as some sort of damage. So fear avoidance training will come into this. Any restriction should allow time to build activity tolerance through exercise and reconditioning at work. Uh, the rehab plan at work, and this doesn't necessarily mean multidisciplinary rehab, it's simply rehabilitation on the job, will also help the person resume normal non-occupational activities, and that's actually an incentive that ought to be discussed. Common limitations, and these are generic and should be tailored to the person in the job, would be no lifting over 10 pounds. Depends on the patient's premorbid capabilities of the severity of the condition. Avoiding over 60 degrees of abduction or forward flexion. Um, Sometimes described as avoiding lifting with the hands above shoulder height. That's obviously not right because that's 90 degrees, but um, people understand that better than 60 degrees sometimes. Um, some other limitations may be required, such as avoiding using shoulders in a static position or highly repetitive use. It's really important to educate the employer to make sure that um, Moderate, and you know, notice this doesn't exactly line up with what we just said, but this is a uh, the next notch up, I guess. More than 20 pounds and more than 90 degrees in abduction or forward flexion. And this can aggravate rotator cuff tendinopathy uh, and inflammatory conditions, aka impingement, rotator cuff tears, ligament strain, sprains, and impingement itself. And this is kind of a big mishmash to some extent, um, diagnostically, not in terms of the patient. The point of the restrictions is to allow for spontaneous recovery or time to rebuild activity tolerance through graded exercise. So you almost need people to be keeping a diary and recording what they're doing on a forward basis. Um, gradual advancement of limitations is recommended to facilitate recovery. Um, there's an example there about advancing lifting capacity. And this is often done with supervised PT or home exercise. You'll see shortly that there's um, not a clear situation about when they need supervised PT. The question is, do you need a skilled healthcare professional? And that has to do with knowledge, understanding, the motivation, and a lot of other things. It's not a blanket prescription to send everybody to be watched while they do exercises. So what are we recommending for treatment? Well, there is some support for forearm support, 
uh, sea level evidence, um, and this is, these are across shoulder disorders. Uh, breaks are recommended as a consensus position, so don't just keep doing things for hours and hours. There's some evidence that the traditional typing posture with the arms at 90 degrees is not necessarily recommended. Um, the issue there is that tra the trapezius muscles and, um, start to tighten up if the ergonomics are not adjusted properly, and then people experience pain in their trapezius area, which they really don't like. Um, we didn't talk about tra trapezius spasm or strain, but that's part of this whole picture. And return to work programs are recommended if there's lost time involved and the person's not getting back. In the area of exercise, we're recommending range of motion. Uh, there's sea level evidence for that, with or without fear avoidance behavioral training, which is CBT. Strengthening after stretching is recommended. Sea uh, level evidence, which isn't the greatest, but it exists. There are no recommendations about aerobic exercise. The reason is that the trials that have been done usually include multiple co-interventions, which is a weak research design in the sense that you can't tell what did what. Now, this is a, sh a set of recommendations for acute, subacute, and chronic shoulder pain. This is nonspecific pain. Um, NSAIDs are recommended by consensus for acute and subacute, subacute shoulder pain. There is A-level evidence for chronic flares after you've had the cardiovascular risk discussion. And there's, you can see the levels of evidence for gastroprotect protective therapy if the patient has risks of gastric problems. Proton pump inhibitors have the best evidence, but a lot of people don't start with those. Muscle relaxants are a consensus recommendation for unrelieved acute or subacute pain with a spasm component. So this would be something like the people who come into your office saying their shoulder hurts horribly and they have a sore area somewhere around the edge of their scapula. Etiology unclear usually. Um, so there's a whole list of things over there on the right for which there is no recommendation because the evidence does not exist. Um, ultrasound may or may not be appropriate in this list, but as far as decent evidence goes, it's not there. Um, steroids for tendinopathies is almost counterintuitive. You can see the rest of this. There's basically no proof of efficacy in the shoulder. Um, Tylenol acetaminophen is, is recommended with cardiovascular risks as opposed to NSAIDs or GI contraindications. A-level evidence for cardiovascular consensus for GI. And it's recommended with chronic shoulder pain, C-level evidence, presumably to avoid NSAID complications, but you have to keep it below 4 grams a day. Capsicum, uh, which is the topical uh, anti-inflammatory derived from hot peppers, is recommended in the short term by consensus and for exacerbations. And again, there's a whole list on the right. Um, topical NSAIDs does not refer to capsicum. It refers to these compounded preparations in people's offices, which they charge a lot of money for. And there's essentially no research on, on anything in this column particularly not on manipulation and mobilization. That used to be a no, but they've concluded that while there are anecdotal reports, it's not a great idea. There's not very good evidence. And then to get down farther, um, tricyclics are recommended for subacute and chronic pain as a consensus recommendation. This is an extrapolation from other parts of the body. The sling we've talked about, self-applied heat and cold, seems to work, but there's no reason for a uh, licensed health professional to do that. There's some evidence, although it's not great, that acupuncture works as an adjunct, uh, particularly with chronic tendinopathy and post-op, but it is not the sole therapy. There's a, a consensus recommendation for interdisciplinary rehab, the same programs we've talked about before. The problem with them is they tend to be different wherever you go, and so you have to be really clear about what you're getting. And there's a pretty strong recommendation, although it's consensus, for using CBT as an adjunct to deal with fear avoidance and so on. 
work conditioning and work hardening are a subset of these programs. There's no recommendation, again, because of no evidence, for prolotherapy, routine use of opioids, and pay attention to that because that there's really no justification for that in shoulder pain. Um, SSRIs have not been shown to be effective. Anticonvulsants for acute shoulder pain, no evidence. Muscle relaxants for chronic shoulder pain, no evidence. If that looks contradictory, it's because the other stuff was aimed at subacute. Uh, the other talk, the other recommendation about mus uh, muscle relaxants. Slings are not recommended for subacute and chronic shoulder pain. There's actually C level evidence that's a bad idea. Uh, taping isn't recommended because of lack of evidence. Magnets and pulsed electromagnetic fields, there's actually B level evidence that they don't work. Now, if we move over to impingement uh, slash bursitis slash tendinopathy, same bucket. Home heat or cold, this is a reasonably similar list, but not entirely. Uh, home heat or cold is recommended. NSAIDs have A-level evidence, which may be extrapolated. Steroid injections have B-level evidence, but this is not an initial therapy. This is done after failure of other treatments. Topical nitroglycerin, somebody's tried, apparently works, but the evidence is not the strongest. The impingement exercises, which include global rotator cuff strengthening, has a consensus recommendation. And arthroscopic decompression is indicated. This is basically a clean-out. Um, if there are activity limitations and moderate to severe symptoms for three to six months. So you can see that there's a conservative interval first. Um, Post-op rehab after decompression is recommended, and post-op acupuncture, again, C-level only. Uh, inferential therapy is C-level against. Extracorporeal shockwave therapy, C-level against. For chronic, and it's not recommended on a consensus basis for acute and subacute. There's no recommendation for various other electrical therapies, again, because there's no evidence. With rotator cuff tears on an acute level, uh, you would use heat and cold NSAIDs and cuff strengthening exercises for small tears, which are common and may or may not be work-related. Um, there's B-level evidence for repair of small tears after failure of conservative treatment. So we're talking a number of weeks out. And interestingly enough, only C-level evidence for fixing large tears with an arthroscope. Foreseeing grafts have evidence against them. Labral tears uh, has an interesting body of evidence. Everything you see on the left is consensus, extrapolating from other things. And, you know, to me, a lot of this stuff about pain relief and inflammation reduction is a um, sort of a temporizing measure in the sense that there's really a tear there and probably really needs to be fixed. This is the same as labral tears in the hip. Um, there are patients who elect not to fix them for a variety of reasons or who aren't surgical candidates because of other medical problems, in which case this column is more relevant. There's no recommendation for labral tears for all that stuff on the right. There's also really no logic as to why this would fix the labrum if it's torn. But in any event, there are no recommendations here. Taping, magnets, pulsed electromagnetic fields, Inferential therapy and injections are recommended against on a consensus basis by the panel. Cuff strengthening exercises are recommended for with small tears. Arthroscopic repair after failure of conservative treatment. Um, apparently the panel thought that if there's a positive MRI more acutely and there are symptoms, like the person's incapacitated, it may be justified earlier, and I think that's, again, somewhat similar to hip. Gabapentin perioperatively is an extrapolation from other body parts. There's no research on it. Other tears, biceps tendon tears, there's a recommendation to fix it. That's consensus. There's no data. Pectoralis tears, same story. Um, AC separations, initially, the idea is to relieve symptoms <clears throat> and to engage in therapy. Um, there's uh, 
a recommendation to use injections prior to clavicle resection. I'm not quite sure what that's all about except temporizing measure. No recommendation for that list on the right because there's no research. Um, the non-operative treatment <clears throat> is, this is interesting and I don't understand it, I have to admit, um, why you would do, oh, I'm sorry, non-operative treatment is recommended by consensus for grades one and two. Most grade threes you can leave alone and not operate on. They may cause a bump, but they don't generally compromise function when they start to adhere back. Um, I guess I missed this. There are actually six grades. Four through six are based on the anatomy of the tear. And uh, those really are recommended for uh, repair. I guess those are pretty much free floating. When I was trained, the idea was to leave them in a sling and they would pretty much stick back together. But uh, this seems to have changed with this addition of the guideline. And there are recommendations against a variety of things on the right-hand side. Uh, with instability, this list is starting to look familiar. It's the same idea for non-operative treatment, uh, all consensus. Um, there's really no place for opioids in dislocations because they're they're over, and so they're not supposed to be causing chronic pain, um, which is also why SSRIs are not recommended. And again, you can see the list of not recommended things. Um, perioperative gabapentin is gaining support, although not research-based, for a lot of things because it apparently reduces the need for opioid use. Um, the panel recommended arthroscopic repair after the first anterior dislocation, uh, so it's not the first time but the second time. Arthroscopic lavage has some support. Um, I guess they think washing out the joint's a good idea. And um, Inferior capsular shifts, uh, it's a, a way of tightening things down. If you do a bank art, which is an open repair, then they suggest accelerating post-op rehab. For calcific bursitis, interestingly enough, the last time we did this, there wasn't any evidence for extracorporeal shock wave, but now there's A-level evidence for this. Chelation therapy has C-level evidence. I think there's some questions about that. The same thing with trying to break it up with a needle, which I would presume is not a lot of fun. Bursoscopy has some uh, some research behind it, as does ultrasound. There are a whole variety of things you can try for adhesive capsulitis, including steroids, manipulation. Uh, MUA didn't used to be recommended. It's now got some C-level evidence. And I think, you know, orthopedists do this as well as uh, chiropractors. But the issue is different. Uh, there's some evidence for exercise and education. Uh, the, the CPM machine with a health enhancement, or home exercise program, rather, has some low-level evidence, as does acupuncture, diathermy, a suprascapular block. Hydrodilation, or blowing up the shoulder with water, is recommended on a consensus basis. Uh, there's no recommendation, again, for this list on the right. Um, again, we've got the same sort of list of what do you do about things that are painful if you're uh, down to the fourth one, third one, sorry, um, if you're not going to operate. And then diagnostic arthroscopy, if there's a treatment failure, open release, but only if it's really bad. For osteonecrosis, um, again, things get interesting. Some of this is extrapolated from the hip, uh, such as bisphosphonates and core decompression, which there is no research on, and arthroplasty with collapse of the shoulder. Early use of steroids is not recommended, and this is sort of a duh because steroids also cause this. There's no recommendation on lifting, or sorry, non-weight lifting. In other words, don't do it. 
for the hyperbaric chamber. You've got the usual list of things to relieve pain, including adjunctive acupuncture. Uh, steroid injections, oh, sorry, this is arthritis, which most likely is not going to be work-related. It's degenerative, but most of us are familiar with the list on the left-hand side, although it's interesting that there's not a ton of evidence on it, given how common arthritis is. Um, and the steroid injections are a fallback. They're not the first thing you'd use. The evidence is accumulating that you get weak tendons and some level of infections if you do that, so you hold back. No recommendation for all the stuff on the right, a longer list, no evidence. Um, the list continues for things for which there is no evidence, although there are enthusiastic people supporting them. Uh, a list of things that are not recommended for osteoarthritis. On the right, and arthroscopy and clavicle resection are recommended presumably in resistant cases. And arthroplasty is recommended. There's evidence it works. The question is, when do you do it? And the answer is usually fairly long-term failure of conservative therapy. We threw in the humerus fracture here. Um, this one really is non-operative, so you're trying to get the person to do early mobilization. Um, you may need supervised exercise because it's not fun, but highly motivated people can do that. Uh, there's no recommendation about internal fixation devices. They're generally not used in this country. I think the Swiss are still heavily interested in such things. Um, clavicle fractures generally are non-operative, but in some people, um, select, again, not defined, possibly people that use their shoulders a lot or ball players. I'm not sure. No recommendation for early mobilization for the fracture, and there is rec uh, evidence against pulsed ultrasound to try and hasten the healing of the fracture. So let's go through some CME questions here. Are there any questions? Let me just check here. So far, no. Nope. So far, there's no questions. So I do want to remind everyone to please submit your questions electronically so that Dr. Harris has time to address them at the end of the session. Okay. So if you want to take a stab at answering the CME questions, get this to go down. Night pain in the shoulder can indicate impingement, adhesive capsulitis, osteonecrosis, one and two, or two and three. Anybody got some ideas about this? Four. And that is correct. Thank you, David. Um, osteonecrosis hurts all the time. And the green slime got the correct answer. Um, injections are indicated after conservative therapy. All of the above or none of the above. Any thoughts on that? Nope. The answer is all of the above. If you go through those complicated lists, uh, ultimately you end up having that recommendation. And the third one, therapeutic arthroscopic surgery, this is not diagnostic, is indicated after conservative therapy for impingement after three to six months, osteoarthritis, labral tear after four to six weeks, rotator cuff tears, presumably full thickness, or adhesive capsulitis, or just arthritis and adhesive capsulitis, or impingement, labral tears after four to six weeks. You'll see there's some conservative therapy periods there, and rotator cuff tears. Any thoughts on this one? Seven. And whoever David is has really got this nailed because that's the right answer. Uh, not generally recommended for arthritis. It doesn't work. Um, and uh, adhesive capsulitis, uh, it's not clear what you're, what you're doing there, so that's not recommended either. 
So how about some cases for about five minutes here, and then we'll get some comments. So the first one, Klaus Clavicle presents to your office saying he can't move his right arm. Sometime last week he was lifting boxes at work while moving his office, a frequently common, more common um, experience now where people keep trying to cut their rents down. He says he, well, he also was playing touch football with his kids, being the quarterback. Several days later, he developed what he characterizes as excruciating pain in his right shoulder with any motion. He states he can't raise his arm, um, although as he goes on, he says he was keeping it as still as possible to prevent it from becoming worse. Does anybody know what that sounds like? Well, somebody's already jumped the gun, David. Impingement and bursitis, I'll hold that in advance. Actually, what I was getting at there was uh, fear avoidance because he doesn't want to move because he's afraid he'll get worse. Not a good sign, unfortunately. So when you examine this gentleman, and i that's the reason I'm holding the diagnosis in advance because we don't have an exam yet, there's mild tenderness to palpation over the subacromial bursa, subacromial bursa and the bursitis groove with complaints of pain anywhere the examiner touches, which is probably non-anatomic. Abduction and forward flexion are 20 degrees only on the right, and 150, which is not full but better on the left, can reach about T10 on the left behind his back but can't reach behind his back on the right. What else would anybody like to know about this? Hmm. No questions. Okay, so let's see what happens when we go down. Well, there's additional history. This gentleman had left shoulder pain several years ago. This is on the right. That took several year, several months to resolve, so there's delayed recovery. He is hypertensive, he's diabetic, and he's hyperlipidemic. He's on hydrochlorothiazide, lisinopril, metformin, and simvastatin. Don't think we need to go through why he's on all that stuff. So is this helping people? Well, we haven't asked a question yet, so that's more history. When you examine the gentleman, to be more specific, his vital signs look okay. He weighs 275 and he's 5'10". You don't see any wasting of the shoulder muscles, which indicates that there was probably no big deal problem before. Uh, if you do the abduction and forward flexion after a great deal of coaxing for him not to help you out, you get 150 degrees just like the left side. Um, thumbs down abduction, which he had to be talked into, was 150 degrees. Same as the other, uh, sorry, it was negative. And resisted internal and external rotation was negative, which tends to tell you that he probably hasn't, in fact, torn his rotator cuff. Um, furthermore, he has, this is the examine the joint above and below rule. His full range of motion of his neck, which is sort of not, a, not the joint, but it's above. And you're concerned about this because this might be a radiculopathy. However, the spurling maneuvers on both sides are negative. There's no tenderness over the cervical spine. Um, the sensory exam of the upper extremities is normal, which tends to argue against nerve root compression, as does normal reflexes and normal motor exam. His work history, which is important, is that he's an HR manager and the company's downsizing. So his job is interviewing people and supervising performance evaluations and employee relations, all of which tend to become contentious when there's downsizing. And he's perceiving hostility from some employees which makes it not fun to be there. So would you like to order any diagnostic tests? And in making this kind of decision, the issue is why are you doing it? And David says adhesive capsulitis. Well, we're not there yet because we don't have any diagnostic tests, although you could certainly try to make a diagnosis on the basis of the physical. Um, so does anybody have any ideas for diagnostic tests? So far, so 
Um, well, the answer really is that you don't have indications for any yet because the physical findings are de minimis, and so it's not clear what you'd be looking for, if anything. What would you propose as a treatment plan? Comments. Well, this would be pain relief using NSAIDs, unless there's a reason not to. Heat and cold, but self-applied. And uh, self-administered shoulder exercises, global strengthening and range of motion. What would you propose if he's not back to work in three or four weeks? Well, what we said was then you want to get into a supervised rehabilitation program, incorporating some work activity so that he is to some extent work hardened and sees what he can do at work. And I think we only have about four minutes left, so um, do a couple of these really fast. Oops, okay, we're going to do the um, evaluation. So back to you, Sandy. Yes, uh, Dr. Harris, if you've got a copy of the slides and wanted to discuss uh, any of the case studies while we get some over no, I think I think we're fine. Those were just UR questions. So, okay. um, if people would answer these slides, uh, we'd appreciate it. And we have a few minutes. So, if anyone has any final questions or comments regarding any of the other topics that we've covered throughout this series, you know, please feel free to submit those. Dr. Harris can still address a few questions. So we had 18 people on here. Now there's 16, and this only adds up to, oh, here we go, adds up to 14, it looks like to me. So if anybody hasn't voted, please do so. And this one final one. polling question to give us some feedback. If whoever didn't like this uh, would send an email to Sandy and give us some ideas for improvement, that would be good. Any, actually, anybody who's got ideas for improvement, we'd appreciate it uh, by emailing Sandy. Dr. Harris, there was a, a question that did come in. I, I see that. Why does NACOM embrace PT? Um, I don't totally, does this mean you have to use ODG to justify PT? Um, the answer basically is that there's no evidence for or against it, and there are instances in which overly aggressive. See, you have to define PT. It's a black box, and you know that could be anything from those huge lists of modalities for which there is no evidence of effectiveness to manipulation, which, as I recall, for most diagnoses doesn't have evidence of effectiveness, to sitting there watching somebody do range of motion. And the question, of course, is do you need a licensed professional to watch them do range of motion or do global shoulder strengthening? The answer in somebody who's motivated and reasonably intelligent is no. So it's a judgment call in consultation with the insurer and the employer. But uh, in order to answer the question about PT, you have to be very specific about which bit or piece we're talking about. Um, and that's the reason that we... You know, we've been over this in other body parts, but saying that we, you should do six or 10 or 12, quote, sessions of PT is actually a meaningless comment because you have no idea what is included in that unless you have a specific treatment plan. And I think in the first seminar, we went through how to manage PT by doing exactly that. So I'd refer back to those slides on utilization management and physical therapy. And it's now 10 o'clock. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for their attendance and especially for Dr. Harris and concluding this four-part series. Um, this does conclude today's program. You may now disconnect.